It's an old cliche in Hollywood that a sequel is never as good as the original. But director James Whale set conventional wisdom squarely on its head with Bride of Frankenstein, the crowning achievement of Universal's golden age of classic horror. Never before had a studio lavished so much imagination, production value, and acting talent on a so-called monster movie. But Bride of Frankenstein truly transcended its genre and remains one of the best-loved films ever produced by Universal. For Mary Shelley, who wrote the novel Frankenstein, the attempted creation of the monster's bride had nothing to do with the sequel. It was always part of her original vision. And just how James Whale and Universal Pictures ended up playing matchmaker for Boris Karloff and Elsa Lanchester is quite a story in itself, and like a good cast, well worth repeating. <laughs> I thought I was alone. It's one of the great American films. It's right up there with Citizen Kane and Sunset Boulevard. And people, free, it's usually discussed as, oh, oh, just a horror movie, but it's much more complex. Do you know who Henry Frankenstein is and who you are? Yes, I know. Made me from dead. The various story elements, the intellectual elements, the artistic and, uh, and acting elements that came to bear in this film really kind of crystallized all the things that had been building in that genre at that studio at that time. I love dead, hate living. You're wise in your generation. The Bride of Frankenstein, quite simply, is the, the most complex and most brilliantly achieved and conceived horror film ever made, and certainly the, the, the crowning jewel in Universal's initial series of horror films. You make man like me? No. Woman, friend for you. It's a wonderful film. It's uh, just delightful, and certainly there are some scenes where humor and terror are all beautifully blended. When you get into Bride of Frankenstein, you're making it all up. There are no rules. The only rules are the rules of the imagination, and Whale had an extraordinary imagination. There are some imaginations which are just best left to go do their own gothic thing. But this isn't science. It's more like black magic. When Universal Pictures unleashed the original Frankenstein in 1931, it found a new formula for box office magic. In a stunning pantomime portrayal, Boris Karloff was catapulted to international stardom. Director James Whale, well regarded for his British stage work, had been imported to Hollywood because of his ability to direct dialogue. Ironically, just as movies were learning to talk, it was an unforgettable silent performance that made the Hollywood careers of both Karloff and Whale. Universal's founder, Carl Lemley, had objected when his son, Carl Jr., first proposed making films like Dracula and Frankenstein. But there was no arguing with the runaway box office. No sooner was Frankenstein complete than the studio began making plans for a follow-up. This time, it was the director who objected. James Whale didn't want to do a sequel to, to Frankenstein. He seemed to be trying to squirm out of it, as it were, you know, avoid it, bypass it, um, do something else instead. He'd said he'd gotten everything out of the first one, that he'd sort of um, wrung it dry, maybe that was a phrase, something like that. You have to remember that Frankenstein was the Jaws of its day, the Star Wars of its day. It was such a big hit, and the studio had so much invested in it that finally uh, he agreed to do it. But again, I love the fact that, that um, he only did it on his terms. In the meantime, Universal once more teamed the winning combination of James Whale and Boris Karloff for The Old Dark House, a sardonic thriller that introduced audiences to the mischievous sense of humor that would become Whale's trademark. The Invisible Man, starring Claude Rains, also mixed laughs and chills and showcased state-of-the-art special effects. The effects in, in uh, Invisible Man are just extraordinary. You still watch them and wonder how some of them were, were done. You're crazy to know who I am, aren't you? All right, I'll show you. There's a souvenir for you, and one for you. I'll show you who I am and what I am. <laughs> uh, how do you like that, eh? <laughs> Whale directed several stylish non-horror films for Universal in the early 30s, including By Candlelight in the Manner of Lubitsch, an adaptation of Galsworthy's One More River, 
in a screwball comedy mystery, Remember Last Night. He always had very mixed feelings about his horror films, that he liked them, but he wanted to be an A-list director. He wanted to make the big money projects, like the way John Stahl at Universal did. And curiously enough, who remembers who John Stahl was? But we all remember the movies made by James Whale. I think that Junior Lemley, who was the general manager of Universal, had enormous respect for Whale. And I think that uh, he felt that uh, certainly uh, what Whale had done uh, with Frankenstein, uh, with The Old Dark House, with The Invisible Man, with the other non-horror genre films he had done, uh, showed a great stylist at work. And uh, although Junior Lemley himself was not, I don't think he would say he was a creative man, he, he had a very instinctive feel, I think, for something that was good. And um, I think he felt that James Whale was the director that Universal had, who probably had the best chance of putting Universal on par with MGM and with Warner Brothers and with uh, you know the big boys in Hollywood. And uh, so he really gave him gave him free reign to do whatever he wanted with the picture. After rejecting several proposed scripts for the Frankenstein sequel, Whale took personal control over the screenplay's development. The fact that Whale didn't especially want to make the film and then agreed to. Um, prompted him to, to offer ideas for the script to the writers, uh, suggest things. At least we have a very good, good indication that he did this. People such as Elsa Lanchester mentioned this, you know, that this was his idea, that that was his idea, uh, that the little people in the bottles was his idea, you know, that he insisted that he, that he um, have the opening prologue with Mary Shelley and, and Byron and Percy Shelley, um, that that was essential, otherwise you wouldn't do it. Elsa Lanchester, for example, told me that uh, Whale insisted that she be allowed to play Mary Shelley and also the bride. Uh, that this was, uh, it was either that or he didn't want to make the, wouldn't make the film. It was a great thrill to meet Elsa Lanchester. I met her in 1981 and she said that it was Whale's intention to show that very pretty people, which is the way that Mary Shelley is presented in the film, actually inside have very wicked thoughts. Can you believe that bland and lovely brow conceived of Frankenstein? A monster created from cadavers out of rifled graves? The money was available to him to make a much more elaborate film than the first one. Because of the success, they, they let him go with the sets and go with the, the f care and the time and the photography and the music so that he could polish and refine and elaborate in a way that uh, the earlier films, which were made faster and, and so forth, uh, wouldn't have permitted. It's such an odd sequel in so many ways. For example, after a brief glimpse of the monster in the beginning of the movie, he doesn't show up again till about a half hour in, a third of the way into the movie. And meanwhile, you've spent most of your time with this very strange character, Dr. Pretorius. Um, I think if you look at Dr. Pretorius, that's an example of how the movie has changed so radically from, from the first one. In the first one, there was the sort of boring Dr. Waldman. And in this one, suddenly there's this, this full-blown, eccentric, very, very gay and funny character that was created by a Whale in the development of the uh, screenplay for the second film. Yes, there have been developments since he came to me. Unlike the original Universal film, Mary Shelley's novel featured a highly articulate, even philosophical monster. Bride of Frankenstein restored the monster's ability to speak. Before you came, I was all alone. It is bad to be alone. Alone. Bad. Friend. Good. Speech was the essential difference between the uh, original Frankenstein and the Bride of Frankenstein. And my father really objected to the monster being um, given speech. He felt it would take away from the original portrayal, and uh, I think he was wrong. History, cinema history has proven him wrong. Uh, it's one of the few sequels that really uh, most film critics regard as, as surpassing the original. Once more, Boris Karloff would face the prospect of a grueling and uncomfortable makeup designed and applied by the legendary Jack Pierce. One of the changes in the makeup, uh, besides the fact that Karloff had gained weight, he wasn't as cadaverous, uh, 
he'd be, I think success, uh, he was able to eat more and, 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 and unfortunately he had a little fuller face. But you know, one of the biggest changes was the results of the fire. You know, so they had singed his hair off and just gave him this almost like a little crew cut, which you know, through the course of the film actually grows, which I thought was pretty neat. His makeup goes through four or five stages of regeneration, allowing him to grow both visually as well as spiritually as the film unfolds. Oh, so they gave him kind of a burn on his hand and a little bit of a burn on the side of his face. Uh, uh, but other than that, the makeup was basically the same. You know, the flat head, and still had the electrodes in the in the brow, and just slightly fuller face with a few little burn scars and the singed off hair. Again, another great makeup. And actually, another change was you see in the in the original makeup, he only had one clamp on his head on this side, actually. Yeah. Um, and it was something I didn't notice for the longest time because. Uh, you see more. You would see more pictures from the bride, and, and you saw the, the two big clamps and the little ones in between, and the ones on the side. And I used to always assume that that was the same on, on the original makeup. And, and it wasn't until later when I started looking at it, I said, "He only has that one clamp." During the filming of the original Frankenstein, Karloff sustained a serious back injury, and suffered many other discomforts due to the weighted boots and heavily padded costume. For the sequel, efforts were made to lessen the physical ordeal. I'm sure they treated him a little more like a star since it, because he was successful for, with Frankenstein in some films after that in Between the Bride. Um, and I do think, in fact, that the, in, the original, in the original makeup, the top of his head was probably fabricated each day, built up out of cotton and collodion. In The Bride and in The Sun later on, there was actually a rubber uh, forehead that went on, uh, which probably sped up the process uh, for Boris and, and Jack. You know, I know he, they gave Karloff a slant board anyways because he still couldn't quite sit down. Uh, I, in fact, I have a picture in my, in my office of him in this great slant board when he's drinking a cup of tea. The makeup posed technical challenges for cinematographer John Meskel, who required special lighting for the monster's unearthly skin tones. Jack Pierce's makeup for the monster essentially was a blue-green hue and color. This was not due to any uh, belief in a color aesthetic for the monster, but for the fact that if the monster were photographed wearing this shade of grease paint on orthochromatic film, and if he was lit as Mescal lit him with blue gelled light, he would read as dead white. As a result, Mescal had to have red added into the makeup of the normal players who might share a scene with the monster and often train warmer lights on them. The makeup for The Bride of Frankenstein is an absolute masterpiece. It's the only iconic female monster to ever come out of the movies. I mean, uh, if you were to think of a, a classic female monster, it's The Bride of Frankenstein that immediately comes to mind. The Elsa Lanchester makeup, I found very fascinating because it was very different from the Karloff makeup. And, and I'm sure what they wanted to do was have her uh, attractive, you know. I mean, you, you didn't want to have a hideous woman, you know, uh, monster. I, mean, I, I don't know if it was an executive dis decision or what. And, you know, we can't have an ugly woman uh, monster. So they came up with this, uh, this uh, uh, again, another icon. You know, when you think of the Bride of Frankenstein, everybody knows that wacky hairstyle, you know. It kind of had that Egyptian, uh, a Nefertiti kind of look to it. And they actually had this wire cage on her head, and that was actually really her hair that was mixed in with it. And they probably filled it in with some crepe wool or something to, to do that. And that, the white streaks and the crazy white streaks. And, and uh, yet she was very made up, you know, you know, almost wore a, basically a glamour makeup. If it wasn't for the fact that they had the scar around the neck, it would have looked like, a, you know, some glamorous woman with a wacky hairstyle. And, and I know, uh, and from what I heard, uh, Elsa Lanchester wasn't too fond of Pierce, I, uh, which I was sorry to hear. You know, I, I actually, you know, as someone who I idolize, like Jack Pierce, it, you know, I've heard from a number of people that he was a crotchety old guy. Elsa Lanchester talked about working with Jack Pierce, and she said that he was an unusual personality. He really almost felt, in her opinion, that he was a god who created these horror characters that Universal marketed. Uh, and that in the morning he'd be all dressed up in a surgeon's smock as if you're about to perform an operation. And she said you went in very timidly into his sanctum sanctorum to have the makeup done. And uh, you waited for him to say hello. You didn't say hello first. He had to say hello first. So he was very, very much in control. He really was a divine uh, presence within his own realm of creating these makeups. Uh, she was very funny. She talked about the scar under the neck of the bride. And she said that Jack Pierce took the longest time to do this, that he went through this incredible ritual of applying this scar that she said Harley really shows in the film. And she said, I'm sure he could have bought just such a scar for 10 cents in a joke shop. But uh, 
<laughs> he had his own way of doing it, and he very lovingly and painstakingly applied the scar each morning to the bride. The idea of the hiss of the female monster came from the fact that she and Charles Lawton used to feed the swans at Regent's Park in London. And she said when swans would come up on the side of the lake, uh, if you went to feed them, that would be all right. But if you got too near them or got near their young, they would hiss. And so she thought of this incredible hiss that the swans would give, and she incorporated it into the Bride of Frankenstein character. The original Frankenstein combined English and American actors, and not always convincingly. Bride of Frankenstein was cast principally with British players. Mae Clark, the original Elizabeth, was replaced by the 17-year-old ingenue Valerie Hobson. Valerie Hobson, who gives an amazing performance, I think, as Elizabeth and Bride of Frankenstein, very stylized. She's like a Christmas angel, the way she appears with the the dress and the flowing hair and everything. Um, I talked to her in 1989, and she had extremely warm memories of having made the film. And she said that the first time she saw Karloff, it was such an extraordinary experience. There he was in complete Frankenstein monster makeup. And she said, I just was so amazed. And all of a sudden, he opened his mouth, and I came this very gentle British accent with a lisp. She said that he was like the great clowns who make you cry. He really made you cry. And here was this monster whose heart was just bleeding to get out of his monstrous self, to find somebody to love, to find somebody to love him in return. And he pulled it off. Remarkable feat of acting, and she was very, very impressed by it. Valerie Hobson was very appreciative of James Whale because she said, of course, not only was he a great director, but that he was, as she put it, so English. And here she was, a 17-year-old uh, British girl in Hollywood. And he, so he made her feel very much at home. And uh, she said she was the victim of James Whale's rather bizarre wit because the first time she met Colin Clive as Henry Frankenstein, that uh, it was the scene where she becomes hysterical and falls into bed with him. And she said that as they rehearsed the scene and she fell into bed, James Whale said, oh, by the way, Mr. Clive, this is Miss Hobson. And there she was in bed with him. So she said it was pretty strange even for Hollywood that that was the basis of their introduction. Colin Clive repeated the role of Henry Frankenstein in what would sadly be one of his last screen performances. Emotionally tortured and ravaged by alcohol, he died two years later at the age of 37. Frankenstein's mentor, Dr. Septimus Pretorius, a role originally intended for Claude Rains, was played by James Whale's real-life theatrical mentor, Ernest Thesiger, an actor reportedly just as eccentric off-screen as on. To a new world of gods and monsters. <laughs> Una O'Connor, who had appeared in The Invisible Man, was another whale favorite and a perfect choice for Frankenstein's twittering housekeeper, Minnie. Although Frankenstein's hunchbacked assistant, played by Dwight Fry, met a nasty end in the first film, James Whale combined several small parts in the bride script to give the actor a memorable assignment. Fritz, from Frankenstein, of course, had been killed by the monster in Frankenstein. Jimmy Whale, uh, I say Jimmy Whale because that's what my father called him, um, liked my dad's work. What we need is a female victim of sudden death. Can you do it? You promised me a thousand crowns. It will be well worth it, and the Baron will pay. I'll try. Bride of Frankenstein is the most visually accomplished universal horror classic, thanks to the work of art director Charles Hall and cinematographer John Meskel. Expressionistic tricks, totally artificial lighting, and these great painted skyscapes, and, and the way the tombs roll at weird angles, uh, I mean, magnificent stuff like that. Uh, one of the things that intrigues me about Whale's career and his work in general is the backgrounds, the backgrounds that he had, that is, as a theater actor, but as a theater, and theater director, but as a set designer in, in the theater, as well as a painter and so forth. And one wonders to what extent he might have had input into the visual, appear the appearance, the look of the sets of, of his films. Uh, in a way or to an extent that uh, most directors at that time would not be likely to do. Elsa Lanchester said when she was not actually needed on the set at one point, he took her to the, to the studio and showed off the forest set. Right? Uh, he was proud of his achievement here. You know, and she, and I, I said, you know, is it, was this his design of this telephone pole forest? where the, the, the trees' trunks are just trunks and it's just bare and stark, in contrast to earlier when there's a, a bucolic uh, scene and, and it's a, a, a very attractive nature forest. She said, yes, of course it was his idea. Um, not that he drew the plans for it, 
but that he would give the ideas and maybe make little sketches and, and give them to the, to the department heads and have them uh, develop it. Cinematographer Meskel achieved ambitious new visual heights with Bride of Frankenstein, the result of a seasoned working relationship with James Whale. John Meskel uh, did a total of five pictures with James Whale, and Bride is probably his best remembered because the film itself is uh, probably the, the high mark of Whale's late period at Universal. Uh, Meskel used a style of lighting he referred to as Rembrandt lighting, which was to use a, a, a central light and a cross light about three quarters through the scene to uh, provide illumination of the subject against a dark background. Uh, it's very much like the, the painting style one sees in Rembrandt, where there is light that is directional and gives uh, contours and, and definition. The crowning touch in Bride of Frankenstein's artistry was the inspired musical score by Franz Waxman. You've got a first-rate cast in an extremely well-written script uh, with a tremendous musical score, one of the most important Hollywood scores of the mid-30s by Franz Waxman. For the opening sequence of uh, Byron and Shelley uh, on the stormy evening at the villa, uh, Waxman wrote a very charming period-styled minuet, uh, which speaks of the life of, of ease and delicacy that we see depicted. And as the, uh, the flashback story is told by Byron, you know, what a setting in the churchyard, he evolves into a, a, into a huge fugue uh, to illustrate the, the horrors and, and terrors of the original story before returning back uh, to the minuet that, that sets us pretty much with period parlor music. And there is an awful lot of, of commentary through the music, you know, sometimes impish, sometimes emotionally reinforcing, but like so much that's in this film, heightened. The basic structure of Waxman's score is Wagnerian. He uses motives for each of the major characters or sequences. Uh, these are thematic building blocks which can introduce or herald each character's entrance or imply their presence off camera when they aren't present. Almost operatically, isn't it? Um, the, the leitmotif approach where you have a, a particular phrase or melody associated with a person, one character or a different character. The monster has a four note motive which seems to be patterned upon his growl. <laughs> It would almost seem that Waxman had observed this in the performance and deduced that from it. Uh, the bride herself has a very exotic, high-flown three-note melody, which is very open-ended and uh, is allowing it to be utilized in many different forms. We first hear it uh, narrative-wise when Pretorius speaks of her imminent birth. Friend for you, woman. Friend. Yeah. Dr. Pretorius, who is the, uh, the kind of Mephistophelian interloper, he's a figure both of, of humor and tremendous evil, has a, a uh, very mad loping theme. It portends uh, all kinds of things to come. Uh, it usually resolves with a small coda after that, which is again open-ended and unresolved. You never quite know what Pretorius is, is going to do or where his actions will lead. Uh, there's a wonderful sequence as well where he is uh, slightly drunk in the crypt, uh, dreaming of monsters to come and is surprised by the Karloff creature. It's done in a very metric fashion, recalling uh, the Danse Macabre of Saint-Saëns. In fact, Waxman called the cue Danse Macabre. Bride of Frankenstein proved a lightning rod for industry censorship, both during and after production. For instance, the prologue was shortened considerably, in part to eliminate all close-ups of Elsa Lanchester's décolletage, and that was just the beginning. The, the film had about 15 minutes of cuts made before it was nationally released, and uh, I think, again, Universal was trying to play it safe. The film was incredibly outrageous and, in some ways, uh, almost subversive, and I think they wanted to make sure it didn't didn't get them in too much trouble. Like all Hollywood scripts, uh, the script for The Bride had to be presented to the Breen office, the censorship board within Hollywood, to have approval and discussion of any objectionable issues. The script contained many religious references, some of which could be intended or construed as bordering on blasphemy. It may be that I'm intended to know the secret of life. It may be part of the divine plan. Henry, don't say those things. Don't think them. It's blasphemous and wicked, 
We are not meant to know those things. The monster is man-made, not God-made, but he yet goes through a Christ-like orbit of, of misunderstanding and ultimate betrayal. The original script called for the monster to mistake the figure on a life-sized crucifix for a suffering, persecuted creature like himself. The censors would have none of that, so the sequence as it plays now, the Christus is a demure background prop, and he instead, more blasphemously, topples the statue of a bishop, as though he's assaulting organized religion. That's something that's a visual cue that was not on the script, and therefore didn't receive objection. Um, when Henry and Dr. Pretorius speak about uh, the, the possible mad plan to create new female life, the blasphemous Dr. Pretorius invokes uh, religious iconography and says, follow the lead of nature or of God as it's scripted if you like your fairy tales. Well, this is not how one likes to speak about organized religion. It's changed to Bible stories, which is a statement of fact. And follow the lead of nature or of God if you like your Bible stories. Though the way Ernest Thetzer reads the line, Bible stories contain such invective and disdain that it's more offensive than if he'd referred to them as fairy tales. This is how one got around the letter of the censor and the spirit of intent. Bride initially had a uh, fairly lengthy subplot involving the Dwight Fry character. Uh, it was probably a misbegotten script idea, but was meant to illustrate the monster as victim. Carl had this uncle and aunt uh, in the film whom he killed and led everybody to believe that the monster had killed them. It was probably about a 10 minute sequence followed by a morgue inquest onto the murders. It had no real bearing on the narrative line and probably stopped the film dead in its tracks at the midpoint. Well, probably wisely removed this and that narrative bridge now was filled by a retake where the monster is discovered in the woods quite benignly trying to uh, get food from some gypsies who of course react in abject terror and this leads us on to the monster in the hermit sequence. Every time I watch that scene with the hermit, the blind man, I'm struck by how sincerely moving it is. I, there's a, no overtone there of, of condescension or, or ridicule or making fun of either of those two characters in that scene or of their relationship, of their, of their need for each other and their relief at finding a friend. So that it wasn't just, you know, I'm going to play games with odd humor. It was uh, sensitivity and uh, that sensibility of, of the, the warmth uh, and, and mutual need that those people find uh, that, that he indulged himself with, too. You know, and that, that wasn't in the first film, either. Those kinds of feelings, both extremes, weren't in the first film. Humor has never been so artfully blended into a horror film as it is in The Bride. Very bizarre, this little chap. There's a certain resemblance to me, don't you think? Or do I flatter myself? Hindsight tells us that, 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 that Whale's sense of humor is sort of camp. I'm not sure that that's really quite how it was at the time. I think the this, this sort of camp and kitschy element of his humor may be something, a gloss we're putting on it some 60 years, 65 years after the picture was made. The humor in Bride of Frankenstein permeates much of the storyline. Uh, it isn't in comedy relief segments, but it is part and parcel with the, the characters and what they do in the main storyline. Uh, Pretorius is a comic figure because of the way he stands outside of life, of the world of Henry, of his own existence, and comments on it, if only in the irony of his, of his perspective. He doesn't take existence seriously, um, so that uh, he, he makes comments about his, his creations of these little people, he makes uh, comments about himself uh, being like the devil or the vice versa. Um, he has an ironic twist to existence, which is from what I can tell, something that he shares, that character shares, and the actor who played that character, Ernest Thesiger, shared with James Whale himself. Dr. Pretorius is firstly an archetypal old queen. I mean, that's, I think we should fess up about that right from the beginning. He is, however, also Mephistopheles to Colin Clive as Frankenstein's Faust, I think. He's the one who is seducing Frankenstein away from if I may 
say, the straight and narrow to back into this very much more um, twisted vision of what he should be doing with his life. I gather we not only did her hair, but dressed her. What a couple of queens we are, Colin. Yes, that's right, a couple of flaming queens. Pretorius is a little bit in love with Dr. Frankenstein, you know? Hmm? The, uh, the gay sensibility yes. response to outsiders, yeah, particularly brighter Frankenstein, contains several. Shall Pretorius is an outsider. Uh, Frankenstein becomes an outsider by being seduced away from marriage and the home to becoming, you know, the, the mad scientist again. And most obviously and most dramatically and most poignantly, the monster is an outsider. It, it's very tempting to assume that well identified with an individual who is an outsider like this uh, that the average person does not understand. Um, I'm sure what James Whale knew what that felt like when he was a youth, you know, as an artistically inclined person in a factory town, in a factory family. Um, he knew what that was like probably well before he knew it as a homosexual, but it was also the artistry being, being an artist, being a sensitive person, being somebody who people made fun of for whatever reason. You find that in, in so many of the characters in Bride of Frankenstein. Beyond its humor, the film also makes a serious comment on the tensions, sometimes violent, between society and the non-conforming individual. The monster is some, the unleashing of, of the id, that which must be kept under control. And when it's unleashed, this is a threat to stability. Of, of society, of human nature. And so somebody must come and, and either kill or otherwise tame that monster that's been unleashed. And the villagers do that, right? The, the, the villagers in Frankenstein and in Bride are, are almost the villains of the piece. Uh, that's especially the case in, in the end of Frankenstein, where they're a lynch mob. I think you have this notion that when people sort of thought as a group it could lead to nothing but trouble. Somehow the m mob mentality was a scarier thing to face than any monster could possibly be. With his stunning production of Showboat, Whale had nearly achieved his dream of creative autonomy and prestige productions. But Universal was burdened with debt, and in 1936, Carl Lemley lost the studio that he had founded. Well, you know, Will had found this amazing niche for five years, working under Junior Lemley, where he almost acted the way an independent filmmaker does today. He really had control. There was nobody, either a studio person or a producer, over his shoulder telling him what to do. When the Lemleys lost control over Universal, that was gone. And Will suddenly found himself working for people who were not in sympathy with his methods at all. It was much closer to the kind of the factory assembly line form of filmmaking that they were doing at MGM and the other studios, and Whale worked very badly in those conditions. The director's last stand at Universal was The Road Back, an uncompromising sequel to All Quiet on the Western Front. Under pressure from the German government, the new studio regime severely cut the picture, and it died at the box office. Whale retired from Hollywood in 1941. Although financially secure for life, he did not live long enough to enjoy the critical acclaim his work finally received. Disabled and disoriented by a series of strokes, he took his own life in 1957. Without Whale's masterful directorial touch, the later Frankenstein films were of little interest to their original star. My father played uh, the monster three times, and the third time was Son of Frankenstein. And at that point, he decided he would not do it again. He felt that the, certainly the storyline had been exhausted, and the monster, as he had created him, had done all that he should be asked to do. He was afraid that it would become the brunt of bad jokes and bad scripts, and there are those that would agree with him. Bill Condon's Academy Award-winning film Gods and Monsters featured a bittersweet fictional reunion between the stars of Bride of Frankenstein and their director. Hey, you, with the camera. We got a historical moment here. Come, get a picture of it. This is Mr. James Whale, who made Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein. And this, forget the baby a second, is the monster and his bride. Oh, Karloff, right. Don't you just love being famous? 
the figure of the bride is so iconic that, you know, she keeps cropping up in all kinds of films. I mean, there's this absolutely wonderful Bride of Frankenstein parody in Small Soldiers. Um, bride, the Bride of Frankenstein shows up in The Bride of Chucky in a very, very clever way. She's alive. Alive! We belong dead. <laughs> I mean, you could do a little drawing of the Bride of Frankenstein, people would say, oh, I know what that is. I remember building little Aurora kits of the Bride of Frankenstein when I was a little kid, way before I could see the movies, and being totally enchanted by having, you know, this, uh, these creatures lumbering uh, across my desk when I went to sleep at night, it felt very safe. Some of these youngsters, seven, eight, nine years old, they know the script backwards and forwards. And so, of course, with the advent of video, it brought it into everybody's living room and now on a DVD. And so it, it perpetuates the, the availability and the appeal is long-lasting and multi-generational. It's a brilliant film. It's a work of genius. And uh, I think it's a picture in which uh, the acting, particularly the performances of Karloff and Elsa Lanchester, Ernest Thesiger, uh, transcend anything you saw being done in Hollywood at that time. Brilliant, almost operatic performances. And um, if ever somebody needs to study a film to see how a director injects his own personality into a picture, Bride of Frankenstein is the perfect example. I mean, you can almost watch that film and feel like you spent an evening dining with James Whale and listening to his wit and listening to his ideas and listening to uh, his remarkable personality. And uh, it's, it's all there in that movie. It's, it is, it's like, it's like an evening with Jimmy. <laughs> 1935 was an incredible year for horror movies. In addition to Bride of Frankenstein, you could see Werewolf of London, The Raven, Mark of the Vampire, and Mad Love. All these films are classics, but almost 70 years later, Bride of Frankenstein still towers above them all. As a follow-up, James Whale was originally scheduled to direct Dracula's Daughter as a Baroque black comedy that would have topped Bride of Frankenstein for sheer outrageousness. But this time, the script was too much for the censors. So, even though we missed the daughter, we still have the bride. And that's something we can all be grateful for. I'm Joe Dante.